So what we're here for today is called execute, right? So I guess the assumption is that a bunch of you are already sort of started, right? Who has a company that has either started recently or you're going to start a company soon? Anybody? A few really, really excited hands. Well, uh, Zach told me last night that I couldn't have slides here. I was really upset. Not true. I've never had slides before. <laughs> but I think um, so. There's a big distinction between getting up the sort of gumption, the the interest, the I don't know how you call it. Probably not an appropriate word, but the idea that you want to start a business and then actually deciding to make something happen. And that's sort of what we're talking about today, right? So for anybody that has an idea that they're passionate about. It's easy to get up the sort of gumption to um, want to expand upon that particular idea. So, for example, if it's a, and, and as Zach said, I, I uh, am not involved directly, maybe not even indirectly in the tech world, but if, uh, if you have an idea about a widget, which I think Chris was talking about earlier, uh, it's easy to get up the gumption or the, the wherewithal to get oriented around that particular idea. Right? So, I really want to make a uh, pencil sharpener, which I believe he referenced. And I'm really passionate about pencil sharpeners. So I really want to figure out the exact angle and how to make the blade sharp and, 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 and all that, right? What's really most important at the startup phase is figuring out how you're going to sell pencil sharpeners. And I don't mean that from a sales point of view, I mean it from point of view of connecting with your customers. Emerson knows what I'm talking about. So staying grounded in your customers. Don't my 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 um, first pitch tonight this afternoon is going to be to really implore you to stay connected at the startup phase to your end user. So I'm gonna pause there for a second, tell you a little bit about myself. I grew up in Virginia Beach. Um, Moved away for a while to New York City, decided to think I could race cars. It was a really humbling experience, but it was a lot of fun. Um, started a business up there. Moved back here because I think because I was uh, excited about getting into real estate. And real estate, to me, I don't have any idea what it meant. I didn't know at the time. I'm sure now, really. But got involved in commercial lending, got involved in flipping houses, which is a whole bunch of fun. And then... Um, learned a lesson in diversification, lost a whole bunch of money, and decided to kind of make a turn. Um, got involved in restaurants and really sort of found my passion. So um, I don't have a huge company. I have a, an assembly of very small companies. We do a million and a half dollars a year in gross revenue. Um, hopefully this year we're going to push to 1.6 million. I'm just kidding. Probably, hopefully 2 million. Um, so really pretty small in general, but really super passionate about what we do. Passionate for a couple reasons because I think we are uh, excited about the business aspect of things and making money and also really excited about community building. So back to why you should stay in touch with your the people who are going to decide to pull money out of their pocket and spend money on whatever you do. One time, hopefully two times, maybe three times, maybe a lot more. It's easy to get sidetracked into what you really love. And I was talking about that earlier. So you get sidetracked into... Um, the pencil sharpener, it's it's great. That's sort of what makes your company, right? You didn't start your company to sort of sell things. You started it because you love pencil sharpeners, right? So who who's heard of Eric Ries? Lean startup, sort of. So so the some of the philosophy is 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 very much based around what is the fastest way you can get your pencil sharpener to market in the least expensive way that is going to produce a product. 
that you can get a true representation from your customer back about. I'm sure that that made sense. So is there a pencil sharpener that you can produce that might not be the ultimate pencil sharpener that you want? It might not be as sharp as you want, but you're going to be able to get feedback about it, right? And you're not going to leverage your entire parent's retirement and lose it. So, so what's the fastest way that you can do that and get a response back? Why is that valuable? Well, it's valuable because you end up with a smaller machine that's able to move much more quickly, respond much more quickly to the data you're getting back and take action that's appropriate. So what happens when you decide that the, the pencil sharpener that you want to build is has to be the sharpest, the best looking, and let's say the most affordable pencil sharpener ever. What happens is you spend a lot of time and a lot of money, hopefully not your parents, in building this pencil sharpener. And at the end of the day, nobody cared except for you and the people who really love pencil sharpeners. So stay in touch with the people that are going to be pulling money out of their pocket to buy your product. So Zach said, I'm one of the most or maybe the most resourceful person he's ever met. I don't know what that means. I told him I thought that might be a compliment. Um, for me, it, it means two things. One is a personal thing, and that is using the experiences that I've had throughout my life to be able to inform, augment, expand on what I'm doing business-wise. I think Chris mentioned, I didn't see everybody, but obviously I saw Chris's, um, everybody's talk today, but you know, Chris mentioned, do what you're good at. And the rest of it, figure out how to have somebody else do it or figure out how to get information from somebody else to do it. Maybe you can afford to have somebody else do it. But I think, I think he's right. And so, so my resourcefulness is sort of deciding what I like and what my experiences have been and really expanding on this. So that's the personal side. The other side is suck it up. You know, you, you, I, I think um, all too often we, including myself, get excited about starting businesses and having ideas and really at the end of the day, there needs to be less, let me figure out how to hire somebody else to do this and just suck it up and figure it out. You don't get paid for your ideas ever. Never do you ever get paid for your ideas in this world, ever. Um, I might be wrong, but that I ever know about. You get paid because you make something of your idea. Do something with it, right? So being resourceful has the, you sort of have the burden. If you want to be resourceful and you don't want to just be I don't know, someone who's going to direct some large portfolio of money. That hasn't been my experience. But if that's who you want to be, and you want to sort of um, simply direct and not get in and do and figure it out and make things happen, well, I guess then go for it. But that's, that's, that, that hasn't been my experience. My experience has been jump in, make something happen. If it means that you need to figure out how to put a nail through a two by four, figure it out. If it means you need to figure out how to write a line of script, figure it out. If, you, if it means you need to go online and find out, find some legal document, figure it out. I'm not suggesting do anything foolish. What I'm saying is figure it out. Don't, don't, um, don't analyze until you, until you can't do anything else. Don't, don't try and figure out somebody else to do everything. Figure it out yourself and do it. Take it on, find somebody. You have plenty of friends, be resourceful. So, everybody's very quiet. <laughs> I love it. So, what's the suggestion? So, what's the suggestion? Uh,
think it's a very valid suggestion. Certainly in the United States, white meat is considered a delicacy, probably borderline. There are two reasons why we use dark meat. One, it's more moist, and two, it's cheaper. So for those reasons specifically, we've chosen not to take on white meat. We also have a 600 square foot facility that does not allow us to have an abundance of choices. Regardless, even if we had a 6,000 square foot facility, one of our mantras is that we like to keep our customers free from the burden of choice, which is maybe different from historically, you know, sort of growing up. And I feel like if you go to many places nowadays, if we're just talking about restaurants in general, it's like the more products we can have, the better, the more. So what we see ourselves off as our curators. So we're looking at chicken, if that's what we're talking about. And we're saying, you know what? There are other options for a chicken sandwich. You can go get white meat, you can go get, I don't know, all sorts of things. Chick-fil-A makes an awesome, um, really uh, not PC chicken sandwich. However, um, you know, it's, it's so, so what we have said though, is that we're gonna, we're gonna find, a, we're gonna collect an assembly of things, be they drinks, because we have two or three canned sodas and a soda we make. So we have a very limited selection of drinks very limited selection of food. But when I go into a place, I don't like to, you know, sort of roll out the scroll of menu options and say, hey, you know, what do I want? So so I'm not saying that I'm not saying that we couldn't make a good white meat chicken no, sandwich. No, no, no. I'm not I'm not using it. It's a great question. It's been asked many times. To help you out we have so um, <laughs> so um, <laughs> I think it's a great question. I don't think it's not valid. I think it's good. It's just not necessarily <laughs> what we set out to do. Who else has a question? I'd like to know why you said like the Ah, good question. Yeah. I'd love that question. Okay, so I live in Park Place. I love Park Place. So I, I think I might have mentioned before I moved to New York City and did a whole bunch of things. So, and when I moved back, I grew up in Virginia Beach and I grew up in this very sort of white bread part of town, very lower middle class. And I was like, I do not want to go back to that. I'm not interested in being involved in that at all in my life. No offense to anyone who is. There's nothing wrong with it. It just wasn't what I was into. So I moved to Park Place because I could afford it. <laughs> and because of the geographic sort of location, right? Where can you, if you sit down and look at a map and you drop a ball and you say, hey, sort of here's the center of culture and diversity in Hampton Roads, Norfolk for sure, probably Hampton Roads. Where can I live as close as possible and afford? That's where it was. So since I, so I moved, we, we built our home, moved in in January of 2010, and really have been super excited the entire time. I will say the, 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 spot that Hanson Biscuit is now was vacant for, I don't know, it seems undeterminable, but people say five to seven years, something like that. And it had all these grates on the windows, like security grates, these welded sort of crazy things. And we started out, well, we signed the lease and didn't know what we were going to do there and sort of figure that out along the way. And um, really thought we were going to leave those grates up. They're kind of like, you know, we, we, uh, this is, we're probably going to get robbed. I mean, we're on the wrong side of the tracks. This crime rate is statistically not any higher than it is in Ghent, but we're sort of around what would be considered to be not as safe of an area. Well, at sort of the very last moment, we said, you know what? Screw it. We're taking them all down, take them to recycling. We're just going to sort of embrace it and own it. And that's what we did. So that's my story in Park Place. Who else? Which community do you know? We're on two streets. We're on Colonial and 26, right at the corner. I think it's great. I think it's great to put your other one across. Right. Okay, so I have a question. Somebody can answer. How much time do I have? Am I over already? Nine minutes. Over? 
or under it? Under. Okay, cool. All right. So I have a question. Who? So I was talking about staying in touch with your sort of target demographic, whoever your customer is going to be. Who has an example of how they can stay in touch? That's pretty hard. Huh? Actually, I started a meetup for bakers. My software is Bakers Unleashed for a management software for bakers. So I had a meetup. My first one was this past Monday, right there in the lobby <coughs> of the, some home bakers in the area. Awesome. So tell me more about how, what kind of baking do you want? So you want to have a, your business is just a meetup? Or is no, my, my business is a, a, a software as a service. Okay. That bakeries can use to manage their orders and their business. Gotcha. Okay. So. So I started the meetup so I could meet home bakers to uh, eventually build relationships with them, convert them to home baker leads instead of just home bakers. Okay, I like it. Who else? Twitter, comment cards, Facebook, any type of social media helps. But I think in the restaurant business. Yeah, I would say, so it's interesting. I think, uh, so p &Ls and balance sheets, which Chris also touched on, those are great ways to look at historically and typically over, well, in a restaurant, we do things, or most of us hopefully do things based around four-week accounting periods, which is different than a month. But the difference in a four-week accounting period is that you have an equal number of weekends in your sort of financial model, which is very important in a restaurant because I just can imagine most people Spend their dollars on weekend days, and when you only work five weekends in an accounting period, it really skews your data. So, um, those types of things are great as far as figuring out what you've done in the past. It's sort of a not up to the minute way to make decision if you're looking for actionable data. A great way to have actionable data is through social media. So you have real time data on how people are interacting and with your product or with at least the, the face that you're putting on your product. So I think, um, I think I'm agreeing. <laughs> Sounds like we're getting a lot of likes on the festival. I have no idea. I think that's basically, I think that's based around Virginia Pilot. Is anybody here from Virginia Pilot? Based around Virginia Pilot. Okay, cool. But nobody else? <laughs> cool. Obviously, that's yeah. that. Right, so it's paid. So the more you put in, you can get gold if you're looking real hard. Also, without actually being paid to do mm -hmm. Which probably never happens, but anyways. No, it does happen. Yeah. But you have to push really hard, though. It depends on if you think it's worth it. On the question about how to um, stay connected, yeah, stay connected. Um, face to face. Right? So I, I think uh, in this age of uh, technological options, people will often bring face to face interaction. Absolutely. I, I mean, I think that's to the extent that you have a business where you can stay connected face to face, it's very important. So let me make one more push. To, uh, I was going to say, um, you've got a guy who works at Hanson Biscuit. I live on 31st Street. Okay. He, I've never really had like a meaningful conversation with him, but he remembers my name. He remembers that I like your soda. He remembers that, you, that I like you know, two sandwiches that I like. I'm in there probably once every two to three weeks, maybe the most. But I mean, just having a good person out there up front like that. Yeah, fun. absolutely. That that definitely uh, definitely helps. You, you know, know what I'm talking about probably too, right? So, I don't know. If they, There's a, know probably one of two guys. Yeah, yeah. a short guy that's a little more. A little shorter. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. yeah. So I got one that I think would be applicable to other folks, yeah. but it's different from where everybody else sits for, I think. Um, and of course, I'm in the disabilities world, but day to day, I don't get to work with people with disabilities, right? We, to art in front of the stadium. Every year there's a conference called the Art Art of Virginia, basically it's an advocacy organization for persons with disabilities, and they have a conference. So I volunteered to be the DJ and host a club night and karaoke. So all of a sudden I am embedded with the staff, the customers, other service providers, government officials. We're all there with black lights and open music on the dance floor having the time of our lives. And for me, that just that gets me generated up again. I know why I'm looking at it so I'll take people's job. And so you can apply that in. I mean, in the restaurant, go on a restaurant tour. 
and just, you know, I'm just the average Joe and listen to what people are saying. And, sure. and so I think you can bed yourself with the customer without them knowing Definitely. that you're there. Definitely. It's, it's the secret boss kind of thing. Right. So I think that's a great way to sort of stay connected. How much time? Four minutes. And there's, also, yeah. and there's, a, there's a guy Sorry. who's kind of interrupting stuff uh, in London, a coffee shop there, uh, real high end, <laughs> not Starbucks, but a real high, high end, like gourmet sort of thing. Coffee, and instead of offering a, a bulky card for his customers, he has a, a 10 punch card where if you go to the 10 other locations within the vicinity, get punched by all of them, then come back and get free coffee for me. Right, that's very cool. The, uh, that's super cool. Really, really, really like that. I think um, so. To take it one step, one half step, maybe further. So we're talking about being sort of staying connected with your customer, and there have uh, been a lot of good ways you guys talk about. I really love that way of, of staying connected with who is paying for your product. So the hard part is to now put yourself in their shoes, right? So back to the pencil sharpener. When I stand on this side of the table and I say, I'm interested in buying pencil sharpeners, but I really don't, I just wanted to sharpen my pencil. I don't really care that it's the best ever. Or, you know, I have some interest in that. You need to tailor your product as you start out right now according to what that person wants. I'll give you a quick example and I'll be done. So I have a construction company that still exists today. We do very um, design-centric, sort of green type construction. Very few projects a year, one to two projects a year. Um, when I started the business, when I, when I started to try and do more high performance building, I was really excited about, hey, how green can I make this house? How energy efficient can I make this house? How much can I sort of in, Press myself with how much, how well this house can perform, right? And at the end of the day, who gives up? Not many people in this market is the answer, right? So it, it wasn't that people in this market don't care at all about design centric or energy efficient houses, but there's an extent to which they care about it, right? So as soon as I spend money and my time and my effort in overbuilding my product, for what the local market is not demanding, I'm crashing my business. So stay in touch with what your customer is demanding. It's easy for all of us, whether it's a pencil sharpener or a human <coughs> services company or a restaurant, to get super excited about overbuilding their product, and it doesn't matter at the end of the day. And people want to say, people tell me, they come to me and say, hey, I really want this to be sort of the best, I want this to be the, the restaurant with the most ever local organic food ever. I'm going to get organic. Nothing that you can get off my menu is not going to be organic. And you know what happens? You drive your food cost up so high that you can't bring organic local food to the masses because you're going to go out of business. So stay in touch with what people are asking. Fulfill your mission. Whatever your personal mission is, however sharp you want to make your pencil sharpener, fulfill that by having a balance of what's being demanded and what you want to put out. I need another beer. <laughs> Any more questions? Are we done? Yes. So what, how do you decide what your next business is going to be? Mm. Man, I am not short on ideas. But <laughs> the challenge is sort of sifting through them, right? And so I think um, through the networks you create, or for, for me, the networks that I create, and the ideas that I have and sort of, I don't know, it's a, that's a long sort of answer. I think um, it's about what pushes the mission forward for me. And right now, it's more community building than anything, mostly because that's kind of where my passion lies. So to the extent that it's community oriented and I think I'm not going to lose money, I think that's where my next business. How's the test going? Super fun. Awesome. You should come out. We're open Friday and Saturday nights, starting at 5 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>